introduce uh, Francois Morier. Uh, he's a software engineer on the Mozilla identity team. The guys who do persona, browser ID, all that. And he fights for the open web by building alternatives to centralized proprietary silos. <coughs> Apple. Uh, a long time Debian developer, Francois has been involved in open source for over 10, year, 10 years now and regularly contributes to several projects. He also volunteers for the FSF, that's the Free Software Foundation, and he leads the development of libravatar.org. His talk today is about killing passwords with JavaScript, where we'll understand why asking users for passwords is a bad idea, and then we'll learn the basics of the browser ID protocol slash persona, so that you can take advantage of persona on their own sites or web apps. With that, take it away, Francois. Thank you. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Now, if you've been following the tech press recently, you will have noticed a number of companies apologizing publicly after getting their passwords leaked to hackers, right? Finding, waking up one day, finding all of their passwords in some place been on the internet. Now, I could make fun of these companies for not following best practices or things like that, but the reality is that doing this is really hard. Keeping passwords secure is a hard problem because you have to do a whole bunch of things. You have to use a secure hash algorithm, i.e. not MD5. You need to use per user cell values. You have to have a site secret that's outside of the database. Then you need to have password and lockout policies to prevent brute force attacks. And of course, the recovery mechanism that you use for when your users forget their passwords that has to be just as secure as the rest of the world. Otherwise, the rest may as well not exist. But what's the biggest problem with this list, though? The biggest problem is that these are the 2013 password guidelines. I can guarantee you that in five years, there's going to be even more stuff that you need to do to protect your passwords. Because this is an arms race between you, the site owner, and the attackers trying to get at your passwords. Not a good position to be in. So for you, as a site owner, passwords are really a liability. It would be really nice to be able to just get rid of them, right? I don't, I don't recommend that you, uh, that you do this right now, but it would be nice, right? So second, problems, second problem with passwords is that they're really hard to remember. That's a big deal for users. Now you may think, well, you know, users could just harden up and use a password manager, right? There's one in every web browser. There's a couple of products that do a really nice job syncing across devices, all of that stuff. But the reality is that when we asked users what kind of password managers they use, they said it's one of these. Not exactly the kind that we like people to use. So instead of using password managers, what do users do? They pick, they employ this strategy. They just pick a really easy password. That way, it's not a big deal to remember that password because it's really easy. This is the top 500 passwords, by the way. You may be able to spot a couple of weak ones. The other thing that a lot of users do is this. They just use the same password everywhere, right? If you've only got one password, it's much easier to remember all of them, right? Because there's only one of them. Now, of course, this means that your security, your, well, basically, you're just as secure as the worst site that you use this password on. Because if that site gets owned, then basically all of your passwords are leaked. Right, so an attacker can just access all of your accounts. So there's lots of problems with this. The other thing, of course, is that passwords will be forgotten, so users have to reset them. You need to provide some kind of mechanism for that to happen. And typically, it looks like this. You type in a username, email address, and then you will receive an email, you click a link, and then you set the new password. Right, the usual password reset flow that every one of us has seen before. Now, what this means, though, is that if you control someone's email account, you essentially control all of their accounts through this reset flow, right? Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, because if you have a strong password and you use two-factor authentication, for example, with Gmail, then that password is very strong, and it's not a big deal. But I'm just saying that's the current state of things today. Now, this is an alternative to passwords, one that's quite popular with a lot of sites. And I'm not saying that it's, that it's always a bad thing to do this. There are, there are lots of good reasons to go that way, which is outsourcing your passwords to a big for-profit company. But um, there are big disadvantages as well. 
And one of them, of course, is what do you do with users that don't have one of these accounts? Right? Nobody is going to create a Facebook account just to log into your site. They're going to use Facebook login. They already have a Facebook login, maybe, but they're not going to create a Facebook login for it. So you, 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 there's a bunch of users that you're going to lose if you don't have another mechanism for logging into your site. But the other thing is that there's an awful lot of users that will not want to sign, sign in with Facebook into your website the first time. Because at that point, they don't have a relationship with your site. They don't trust you yet. And they know that Facebook shares a lot of information with your site. So there's about 10, 15% of users, sometimes more, that have a Facebook account and won't use it to sign into your website. So you're, lo you're losing quite a few users, actually. The ones that don't have a Facebook account and the ones that don't want to use it. So it's something to think about. Now, what about OpenID? OpenID is really interesting because it brought back the idea of decentralization. To the, to the idea of web login. Now, decentralization is good because it allows users to trust, to choose who they trust. When you choose an identity provider, you're basically choosing someone that has the ability to impersonate you on a whole bunch of websites on the internet. So you better choose someone that you trust. And unfortunately, when we don't have a decentralized system, you're forced into trusting someone that a site has selected for you. That's a problem. Now, the biggest problem with OpenID, though, is this. This is what OpenID looks like. It's a URL. Now, URLs work for all of us because we know what they are. In fact, many of us probably have a vanity domain that we use, right? So we, we have very short and nice URLs. But it doesn't work for the average web user. They're confusing, and they don't associate URLs with themselves. So what did sites do, the sites that, that are using OpenID? Well, a lot of them said, Screw this URL stuff, it doesn't work. I'm just going to pick the most popular 10, 12, whatever, um, OpenID providers, and then users can just click on the one they have or choose one of these to log in, right? But notice what happened here. We just lost the ability, we, we just lost uh, the ability to, for users to choose who they trust. Now they have to choose someone from this list that has been pre-selected by the site. And in fact, that didn't even work because there's was, there was far too many choices. Um, it's confusing for users, so a lot of sites said, oh, well, just pick a top two or whatever it is, right? So it made OpenID usable at the cost of decentralization. But this is the real reason why we can get behind OpenID as Mozilla. And the best way to understand the privacy problem with OpenID is to think of this analogy. Imagine that the next time you want to check into a hotel, when they ask you for a piece of ID to make sure that the name matches the one on the reservation, what if the hotel were to phone up the government that issued that ID to check that it's actually valid? All right? It would be a little bit creepy because all of a sudden that government department would have a trail of every hotel you've ever checked into. But furthermore, they would have the ability based on other information they have such as, I don't know, maybe you have a student loan that you haven't fully repaid yet, they would have the ability to say no to your hotel stay. They could say, well, you still have debts. You shouldn't be going to these luxury hotels. Pay your debts first, right? It's a bit of a stretch, I, I admit. But unfortunately, these are exactly the, the kinds of powers that we give to an OpenID identity provider. Also to Twitter, Facebook, and the centralized authorities. But this is the, the deal with privacy. So all of this to say that the existing login systems on the web are not good enough. That's why we're still stuck with so many passwords. So if we're thinking about the ideal web-wide identity system, what would that look like? Well, the first thing is that just like OpenID, it would be decentralized. Right? It's important to give users the ability to choose who they trust, to change identity providers, and to run their own if they want to. OpenID did this. We, we should do this. The next thing is it has to be simple. If the user experience is not great, then users are not going to want to use your site. Then you lose a whole bunch of potential customers. Or if they really have to use your site, like it's an internal site and they need to use it to get paid, um, then they're going to fail and then they will drive up your support costs. Right? So it has to be simple to, to actually work. But it also has to be simple for developers. Because if it's not simple for developers, there's no chance it'll ever be secure. And finally, we're no longer in 2003. Internet Explorer no longer has 95% market share. 
we need a system that works on more than one browser. It needs to work on all of the browsers that people use on all of the devices that they use. Otherwise, it's useless, right? If I was standing here and, and telling you about a plugin system that only works in Firefox, you'd be right in not being interested. So what if this were a standard part of a web? What if it came with your web browser, this login system? Well, that's exactly what we're building with Persona. Now, let me show you how it works. First thing to know is that Persona is based on the concept of a verified email address. This is my email, or one of my emails. If I can prove to you that I own this email, then when I come to your site, you can create an account for me that's tied to that email address. Next time I come along, you will, I will show you the same proof, and then you can let me in. Right? No passwords, need, no passwords needed. That's the idea. So verified email address. And so um, I'm going to invite Nigel and Rakesh to uh, join me for uh, a little demo of the browser ID protocol. That's the protocol behind Persona. So I'm going to be the browser. Nigel here is uh, going to be. Thank you. N Nigel is going to be Wikipedia. So I'm going to try to log into Wikipedia using uh, browser ID or Persona. And Rakesh is going to be Gmail, my identity provider, because I've got a Gmail address. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm the browser. I'm going to generate a uh, public and private key for that identity. And uh, I'm going to call that a certificate with that email address. So I've got a little certificate here with my email address. And now I need to get it signed, because it needs to be a verified email address. So um, I'm going to go to Mr. G. Hello, Mr. Gmail. Hello. Oh, you don't have a mic. I will uh, bring a mic for you. <laughs> oh, let's try again. Hello, Mr. Gmail. Hello. Could I get you to sign my certificate, please? Sure. What's your password? Ah, good point. I actually need to authenticate before Gmail agrees to sign my certificate. So. <laughs> Thank you. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Here, <laughs> so I'm locking this now with my private key. Excellent. Thank you. You can keep your private key. I don't need it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Although that said, it would be really handy next time I need a new certificate. <laughs> All right. So, the, uh, so now here I've got this um, certificate that is signed by uh, Gmail. So what I need to do now is... I need to uh, create an assertion. Now, if I were to use this directly to sign into, um, to sign into uh, Wikipedia here, the problem is that Wikipedia might be able to just turn around and then impersonate me on another website because it would have my certificate. So instead what we do is we don't use certificates directly. We use assertions. Assertions are this little cryptographic bundle that contains three things. It contains, of course, a certificate, but it also contains an audience and an expiry. The audience is just the URL of the site you're trying to log into. So in this case, that's wikipedia.org. The expiry, I'll say expires in two minutes. That will give me enough, times, enough time to sign in, and then the assertion becomes useless. So there you go. Going to seal my assertion. Put my certificate in it. And now I'm going to take it to Wikipedia to log in. Hello, Wikipedia. Can Hello. I log in, please? Um, well, let me check your assertion. The audience is Wikipedia. Oh, that's me. And the expiry is in two minutes. Um, OK, this is the right time. I am going to look at your certificate. OK, so you have your provider is Gmail. So I'm going to get a key from Gmail. <laughs> Hello, Gmail. Can I have your public key? Sure. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> so notice here that uh, when Nigel went over to Rakesh to request his public key, he left my uh, certificate in here. He didn't actually need to reveal to Gmail who was trying to log into Wikipedia, because it's the same public key for everyone. So that's where we get the little privacy thing. OK, so I'm going to um, try and unlock this with Gmail's key. Oh, it works. 
Uh, welcome to Wikipedia. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Excellent. So that's, um, that's the browser ID protocol for you. Now, I'm going to show you uh, a little demo of what it looks like on the web. And I'm not going to use the Wi-Fi. Instead, of, because I've got this little screencast here. So this is Boost, a site that uses Persona. It uses Persona and Facebook. And uh, the Boost guy tells us that there's about 60% of users that prefer Persona to uh, Facebook. So let's just sign in with Persona, since it's the most popular option. And here we're using an id.me email address. id.me is a domain that has native support for Persona. So what's happening now is that we're being bounced over to id.me to get a signature on our certificate. id.me is asking for a password because that's the, the email password for id.me. That's what they use as a login mechanism. So we provide that, id.me says yes, signs the certificate, it's returned to the browser, used to create an assertion that is then sent to uh, Voost to log in. And there you go, as you can see in the corner, I'm logged in. Now because I have the certificate on my browser already, I can use it to sign into another site that uses uh, Persona for login. So this is DebugX. As you can see here, I've got my email address already in the dialog. So two clicks to sign in, second click is for user consent. And there you go, sign in to DebugX. So the point of this demo here is that Persona is today a decentralized system. ID.me has native support for Persona, and that's where we went to get the signature on the certificate. It was their, their sign-in page that we saw. But the Mozilla was not involved in that part of the transaction. Now, the fact that it's decentralized means that everybody is free to innovate on the login mechanisms that they use to sign in with Persona. We've seen someone that, you, that uses PIN codes sent by SMS. There's an identity provider that does that. It's another one that uses Jabber, YubiKeys, uh, LDAP, that's the one that we use internally at Mozilla, and then even client certificates. There's a guy that works with CA that has written one of these. And uh, there's also a, a slightly crazy person that decided to put, that he didn't want a backend for his identity provider, so he put the public key and a private key in full view of everyone, but he encrypted the private key with a password, so everything happens in the browser. Pretty cool, not sure I would recommend it to everyone. Um, but the main thing that I want to make, the main point I want to make here is that we want decentralization. It's a good thing, but it's not a product adoption strategy, right? And by that, I mean that you can't just wait for all browsers to support Persona before you get started, right? What we want, where we want to get is there. We want new functions directly in the DOM. We want functions that are available to all browsers. But how do we get there, right? Well, one way to get there would be to create an, an add-on or, or a Chrome extension. But then that would require users to install these things before they can use Persona. Not a very good thing. Sites are not going to be interested if only 15% of their users can use it, right? Next thing we could do is we could build it into Firefox. And in fact, we are doing this. But the problem with this is that we can't rely on this. Because this is, what, at best a quarter, a third of the browser market? It's not enough. There's not a site that will be interested in this. Right? Well, we could also build it in Chromium. That's the open source project behind the Chrome web browser. But still, we're looking at, what, like half of the browser market? Three quarters, if we're, if we're lucky? I don't know. It's still not enough. We, we need to have a system that works everywhere. So this is what we decided to do instead. JavaScript. We wrote a JavaScript shim, temporary JavaScript shim, that makes it work in all browsers. And this uh, pattern that I'm going to show you is called Lyft, or Locally Isolated Feature Domain. Now, what this means is that if you want trusted code running in the browser, which we do because it's dealing with people's private keys and things like that, um, first thing that you're going to do is you're going to get a domain. The domain, in our case, is login.persona.org, this one. And then you're going to use local storage. Now, local storage is interesting because um, everything that will be stored in local storage using the code that's on that domain will be tied to that domain. So if you generate a pub, if the code on login.persona.org 
generates a public key and a private key, stores it in local storage, then only that code can access the, the keys, which means that they, another website, I don't know, Wikipedia, can't actually go and, and touch the keys. The last piece of the puzzle is post message. This is what allows us to do cross-domain communications. So the whole thing looks like this. You've got Wikipedia on one side that's talking over a post message channel to the shim that's running on login.personal.org. And that's the piece that has access to the keys. And over there, it can decide what uh, restricted API to offer to all the sites that use Persona. Make sure that they can use the system, but they can't actually have access to the keys. And what this means is that we work on all modern browsers, both on desktop and mobile today. The second part of this, though, is that we can't wait for all domains to add support for Persona before we get started, because we're going to wait for a really long time. There's an awful lot of domains on the internet. And so what we built here is a temporary centralized fallback. Now, I say temporary because as soon as a domain gets native support for Persona, the, the fallback automatically goes away. It's only there when it's for domains that don't support Persona. So let me show you how that works. So this is a slow blog. It's a site that uses only Persona for logins. I'm going to click uh, sign in. And this time, I'm going to use an AOL.com email address. Yes, they still exist. So now what's happening is that it's asking me to pick a password with the fallback identity provider. So when a domain does not support Persona natively, that's where the, uh, the fallback identity provider kicks in. And this one asks us to set a password that's not specific to the site for all Persona sites, um, but just to make sure that we don't have to confirm our email all the time. Next thing is that it sends us an email with a, with a unique link to click on. That's to make sure that we're actually the owner of that email address. Before the fallback identity provider is willing to sign certificates on behalf of, um, of AOL, it will check that we're actually the rightful owner of that email address. And so there we go. We're all done. We confirmed the email address, and now generate an assertion with the signed certificate, and we're logged in to Solon. So the point of this demo was to show you that Persona works today with all email domains, either through the fallback or through native support. But we can do better than this. There's a feature called identity bridging. And what that is is that if you look at a couple of email providers, they already have an API that, that people can use to authenticate against them. For example, Yahoo has OpenID. So what we built is a bridge that talks OpenID to Yahoo and browser ID to your browser. So let's see what that bridge looks like. So this is another uh, persona-only site called ReasonWell. And I'm going to sign into this one using a yahoo.com email address. And what you're going to see here is that the bridge is going to kick in. And the bridge will then bounce us over to the real Yahoo login page. So we don't have to set a new password. We're just using our existing Yahoo password. And Yahoo will then uh, confirm to the bridge that, yes, it's the right person because they authenticated successfully. And then the bridge will be able to sign uh, certificates on behalf of Yahoo without having to have an email confirmation step for that user. And so there you go. Certificate is signed, and we're logged in. As easy as that. So it works today with Yahoo, as you just saw. And uh, it also works with Gmail. So we have a bridge that speaks OAuth to Gmail and then uh, browser ID to the browser. So, which means that today all of these users have a near native experience with Persona. So, Persona works everywhere. Um, before I go, though, I want to share with you a couple of uh, quick lessons that we learned in that project. And the first one is that user testing is really important. This is what we use to recommend to, pe to people. Just put this button when you want to add Persona to your website. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. A lot of people don't know 
what the hell a persona is, and they don't think they have one. So they didn't click on that button. Even worse was this one. Now, a couple of people used this because they had, I don't know, like Facebook, Twitter, and then they just added a third thing that was Mozilla Persona. Uh, unfortunately, this was even worse because a number of people were like, oh, well, I use Chrome. I can't click on this because it, it, this obviously requires Firefox. It says Mozilla, right? So don't use this either. What we found is that this one works a lot better. Sign in with your email. Everybody has an email. You just click the button and use it to sign into this website. Second thing is nobody wants to be first. This is not a surprise, right? But this is a very uh, popular question that we get. How many users does Persona have? Um, it's really annoying when you're trying to start a new project, right? When you're trying to start a new identity system, um, the answer is initially zero, right? Um, but what we did is with this bridging that I've just shown you, now we're able to say that we have 700 million users that are ready to go with Persona. They don't need a new password. They don't need to click an email link to get started. So that's a big deal for us. And finally, if a problem has been around for a while, like password problem on the web, uh, it's probably a hard problem. See if you can solve parts of it. For example, with Persona, we're not going to solve this problem. You're not going to use Persona to sign into your uh, servers via SSH. You're also not going to be able to use Persona to log into your Windows desktop. And that's okay, because Persona is designed as a simple login system for the web. That's what we're focusing on. That's the problem we're trying to solve. Now, how simple is it for developers to add to their website? Well, the answer is it's really just four steps, four pretty easy steps. And you can find them at that URL, which will be at the end of the presentation as well. But just to give you a flavor, the first thing you have to do is to load this JavaScript file. So this is the shim. This is a temporary JavaScript shim that works around the fact that browsers don't have native support yet. Then what you do is you call a setup function. You pass in two callbacks. The one for uh, when it's time to log a user in, what do you do? And the next one is when it's time to log a user out, what do you do? Um, the third one is you have to hook your login and logout buttons to the right things. So login will, would call navigator.id.request. No parameter is needed. And logout would call logout. Finally, you need to verify the assertion like Nigel did. Server site. Uh, it's important because you can't trust the client to not lie about it. Uh, and for that, we provide a bunch of libraries. Uh, usually, it's just two lines of code, and you're done. And the best part is that you don't need an API key for this. None of this bullshit. You don't have to, to ask for permission before you use Persona. Now, I want to leave you with one small request, and that is stop making the problem worse. Stop making the password problem worse on the web. And by that specifically, I mean, if you're building a new website, default to Persona. Now, I'm not saying you should always use Persona. There's lots of reasons, there's lots of good reasons to uh, use something else sometimes. But don't start with a default of asking users to pick another password. Just start with Persona, and if it turns out it's not the right system for you, choose something else. But don't start with passwords. If you have an existing site, please add Persona to it. As you've seen with Foost, you can uh, easily have Persona next to Facebook. And in their experience, it actually works better than Facebook but, uh, for their particular site. Uh, but there's no problem in using Persona alongside other things. Uh, what you might want to get rid of, though, is any sort of fallback mechanism you have. Um, other than you know the Facebook and Twitter things, if users don't want to use those, um, if you have if you're asking for an email and password, for example, you can replace that with Persona. Um, here's a concrete example. This is how you sign up to Pinterest. This is what they have currently, and this is what I'm suggesting they do instead. Can you see the difference? The difference, of course, is the click handler on that button right here. Right? Um, you change that to use Persona, then you can get rid of that ugly form and that uh, ugly column as well. Thank you very much. Pat, uh, I have a question. And, uh, there's one there. Yeah. So, um, so obviously you need a browser for this to work, right? So what if I want to access an API that's, uh, you know, uh, API that's exposed by a website that's behind a persona thing? Like, 
I, I'm I'm writing a thick client, a desktop client to invoke an API. I won't be able to use Persona then, right? So okay, so so the question is like basically if you if you're using like another application that wants to talk to an, an application, you'll be a REST API. How to use uh, Persona, that kind of stuff. So Persona, the, the, what we have to 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 uh, distinguish is authorization and authentication. Persona is authentication. So what you would do in that case is uh, is use a different technology for the authorization part. So for example, you, uh, if you want, uh, say you have a, a, um, a thick client on, on, on a, I don't know, a Windows desktop or whatever, that needs to authenticate with your app. What you would do is you would show a web form initially to the user so that they log in. And at that point, they log into your website and some kind of token is exchanged. The app has, keeps the token and the token can be revoked later. But basically, after that, when the app needs to, 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 to talk to your REST API, then they would just exchange a token. They wouldn't use Persona for that part. We only use Persona for the initial uh, setup phase. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, not, like, we're not trying to replace OAuth and all of these things that, that people do. We're trying to, to get rid of passwords, basically. Uh, I'm Kostov. Uh, I just want to add something to what you said about the setup part, is that there are plugins available for Drupal, for WordPress, and for Drupal is the breeze to set up Persona. You just install the Drupal module, and uh, the module does everything on its own. Yeah, there's there's lots of uh, that URL here, uh, libraries and plugins. There's lots of libraries available for language for various languages. Uh, lots of plugins available for for uh, like open source software frameworks, things like that. So thank you very much. It's a good point. Hello. Right. Right. Yeah. In the second video, uh, in the fallback mechanism, right? When the email comes to the user's uh, inbox, the look and feel of that email was not of the website that he was trying to log in. That could be a really uh, jarring user experience, in, in my opinion. I'm, I'm glad that you point that out because uh, because we we have uh, a new feature coming in. To uh, it will be coming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's it's actually committed to the repo. It just needs to go through QA. Uh, that actually adds branding to the email. So there will be an ability, I believe, to put the logo of the of the site and then the background color um, for for that okay. site. That yeah. should be uh, just like in the case of Voost. I don't know if you noticed, but Voost actually had a logo on the right hand side. So in the persona in the persona dialog, you can customize the background color, okay. the logo. Perfect. As well as the name of the site, so you can actually brand the the right half. You can they can be all branded for your site. The left half is is obviously you know like asking for emails stuff. That's persona specific. Uh, one more question I have is that uh, in persona, all that information that I get about the user is just his email address, right? Yes. Uh, so you only as opposed to email. if I was using Facebook login, I would get all of his profile and friends and. Relationship status, and I don't know what it's possible. Yes. Has, in your experience, has the, has this been a concern from the website developers? So um, we've 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 talked to a couple of people that use uh, that use Persona, like the the debug X guy, for example. We talked to him, the first guy, um, and uh, all, like a couple of them. I, I I want to say all of them, but but at least most of them said, please keep it just to e the email. That's we want to keep. We we like that simple. And and it is and, and it's a it's a simple story for users as well. Like if you log in, I'm gonna get your email and that's it. They really like that because the, a lot of people that click on there definitely don't want to click on Facebook for that exact reason. So, so I think we're gonna we're probably gonna keep it that way. Hello. Oh, there we Hi. In the fallback mechanism, you said that the uh, secret key will be stored in the local storage, but I doubt the local storage is not a foolproof mechanism since any cross scripting attack, uh, any, uh, any hacker, if uh, or any security breacher, if he hacked your, uh, if he does a cross scripting attack on your website, then he will be able to uh, grab those things from the local storage. So, how it is secured? So, the, so the question was about the the security boundary for local storage. Um, the uh, if if the JavaScript of the shim is compromised, then you write. Um, that, that it's then, then basically, that's that's the JavaScript that has access to the key. They can, they, they could just, you know, the attacker could just take the keys and post them somewhere else. 
Um, if, uh, if, it, if you're talking about the JavaScript for the site that's compromised, or something like that, something that's not on the login.personal.org domain, then that JavaScript doesn't have access to that part of the local storage. So, it, it, so for an attacker to actually get to your keys, they need to actually inject code on our servers, on the login.personal.org domain. Uh, and that will also go away when we have native support in the browser. So in the native version of, of Persona in Firefox that we're working on, uh, the keys will not be stored in local storage, and the code that's accessing it will not be downloaded through the internet either. So, but, but still today, like, it's, it's safe from a, a typical cross-site scripting attack. Uh, so, I, like what he said, I just wanted to know, uh, now with that, we have packaged applications using uh, Firefox or Chrome. So, suppose uh, I'm building an offline application that I need to run on a, on a user's desktop. And uh, I want uh, the support of Persona over there too. Uh, even when cases, uh, when internet is not there. So, what is the support for that? So, that comes down to pretty much the same question that, that this guy yeah. had. Um, you use Persona for the in initial login to exchange some kind of token, and then you use that token in for the, the authorization kind of aspect, you know, for the every everyday kind of request to, to REST API or whatever. You just present a web view the first time. And so there's people using it successfully on mobile and other things like that. And that's kind of the approach that they use. The last thing you want is to show the password prompt every single time someone signs into your app, of course. Uh, hi. Uh how safe do you think would it be to use Persona on a shared computer or a shared browser, maybe? Ah, so what happens when, uh, when say, you're in an internet cafe or something like this? Um, what I didn't show in the demos is that the first time we assume that you're on a shared computer. So we make the certificates valid for a very short amount of time, and, uh, and, and they basically go away when, when, you, when you close the browser. Now, in most, uh, in most internet cafes, uh, the... Uh, between users, like the, the cookies will get cleared, and local storage is actually cleared at the same time as cookies. So it's not usually a problem, but we still, is, we still use shorter, short lived certificates, short lived sessions the first time you use Persona. The second time we ask you whether or not it's your computer, if it is your computer, then we extend the length of the as if certificates. If you say that it's a shared computer, uh, then we keep really, really short. So it, there's, a, there's a small window of opportunity if you, if you, you know, go away and, and, and you leave the computer without clearing the cookies and stuff, but otherwise, uh, it's, it's fine. Yep. Um, in your, with your... Question from Gmail here. <laughs> yeah, question from Gmail. Uh, do you have any suggestions uh, to help sites transition from their current, uh, other than, of course, alter table, drop column, uh, any other suggestions in terms of UX to smooth the transition from their current database-based login system to personal? Right. So, um, I've... I've what I would recommend there is that, first of all, you, you, uh, you start in your application to make sure that email addresses are unique for your users. So it has to be unique. Uh, then you can add persona support without removing the existing uh, thing that you have. Basically, if someone wants to log in with persona, um, you just do an email lookup in your database. You find the account that matches that email, and then you sign the person in. Um, the other thing that I would, and so you can keep the two systems for a while while people get used to it. Um, one thing you can do as well is you can be sneaky and you can, in the, in the I forgot my password page, you can say, hey, if you were to use Persona, you wouldn't need to reset your password, you know, like, so you can do stuff like that. And, uh, and then when you're ready, then you can go ahead and get rid of the form and delete your, your password column. Um, but yeah, th there's a couple of things. If you, if you go on to, um, uh, the, um, to MDM, the quick setup, at the, at the very last step, the, like step number five is, is what else, like is more information about, about Persona. Um, and that's where you can find things on how to make sure everything is secure and also like, like advice like what you just asked for transitioning. Uh, things like uh, having more than one email, changing your email, those sorts of things. So we've got a little, a few things on this. One last question. Yep. Yeah, so, for my understanding, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, can I think of this as uh, open ID, but instead of uh, URLs, we are using email addresses? Um, it's it's a it's an interesting way. So, like, how you you can sort of think of it as as open ID with emails. Um, when but but I think what you mean there is open ID as in you know 
the descent because it's decentralized and it's pretty much the only widespread system that, that was decentralized. Um, I think it's still different from OpenID for, for, for three reasons, like usability, of course, as you mentioned, it's not URLs. Um, also security, we want to build it into the browser so that it can no longer be uh, fishable because with OpenID you can just fake someone's IDP pa login page, you can grab their password. You can do the same thing currently with Persona because it's all happening in a browser, but like in the content win window of the browser, but once we pull it out into the browser UI, then it's not gonna be uh, possible anymore. And, uh, and the last thing is privacy. I think it's a re really big difference with, uh, with OpenID. I mean, it, with Persona it's a little bit like um, how you use these things, these passports, to travel to international countries, right? Like, the first thing you do when you want to go to another country is that you go get a new passport from the passport office. At that point, you don't have to tell them which country you're going to, to visit. You just get a passport that works for all of them. And then when you go to the other country, you present your passport and they let you in. But the step of getting the credential and using the credential, those things are separate. They're not in the OpenID world. So that's a big difference. That's how we can get the, the big privacy advantage for Persona. So anyways, that was the last question, but um, I'm going to be here on all the evening and uh, tomorrow as well, so feel free to approach me or other Mozilla people if you have any more questions. Thank you very much. Big round of applause, guys. <laughs> the Mozilla guys are just superstars. Keep going up to their booth and bugging them. They will be, this is their job. They love answering questions and telling people how to do it right. Uh, thank you, Francois. Uh, one more round of applause. That was pretty cool, man. Come on. <laughs>